In a recent post, I asked for viewer design reviews and that viewers send me their files and quite nicely a few viewers have sent me their files to review. I'd like to make this a more frequent occurrence, so if you have your own design files for PCBs, hardware and so forth that you'd like to review and also share publicly, at least most of it, on my channel, then please do so. The way you can contact me is go to phils-lab.net forward slash contact and either fill in this form or send me an email directly to this email address. We're going to be doing a couple of design reviews. I won't be doing any in-depth design reviews, but showing you a general gist of how a design review might go, how I might go through the design and what is important to me, what is well done, what isn't maybe well done, and so forth. Quite a number of the designs you will see were actually made, assembled, or manufactured by JLC PCB in China, and JLC PCB, as usual, is also a sponsor for this video. So we get to see the board quality, and that quite a lot of product people choose JLC PCB for their designs and manufacturing, given the cost and quality. As usual, also a huge thank you to Altium for sponsoring this video. Although I won't be featuring Altium in this video, I have many videos on my channel that showcase all of the powerful features that Altium Designer has. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab and get yourself a free trial of Altium Designer and 25% off your license purchase if you choose to do so. To help you get started with Altium Designer, I do have several videos on my channel, including this about three hour video, giving you a complete walkthrough from project creation to getting these boards assembled and manufactured with JLC PCB. But without further ado, let's get started with the design reviews and thank you so much to everyone who has submitted their design for, to be reviewed. The first design we'll be looking at, and, and keep in mind I'm not doing this in any particular order, basically the order I received these designs in. The design we'll be looking at is a custom Spartan 7 FPGA board, quite exciting, uh, that Andrew, the guy, who, the guy who made this board, used KiCad to build and submitted also some various information on the EV, EV blog forum, and you can visit the link at the top here to find out more. Andre has also made this repository public, so you can go to GitHub and then also check out the files for yourself. Andre quite nicely he also included some pictures of his boards. So these were these were manufactured by JLC PCB, but actually hand assembled by him, which is quite impressive. So we have a Spartan 7 XC7 S50 FPGA, various surrounding circuitry, the regulators. We have DDR memory, sort of sort of HDMI interface, program interface, and general purpose header. It seems like on the back side we can see also 0201 components, which hand soldering is no easy challenge. So that's uh, that's very well done already on that part. So let's go into KiCad and have a look at this design more in more detail and see what maybe I would do differently and what was done quite well. So you have Andre's FPGA project open. The first thing I notice is, okay, it's a hierarchical schematic, but unless I scroll in and look at what these schematic names are, I don't actually know what this project is about. The title block isn't filled in. Uh, I don't have numbers for my schematic pages and so forth. So it's just for neatness and for, for the schematic sake and communicating design intent, it's useful just to annotate the schematic a bit more. This is me the first time opening this schematic. Okay, what is actually going on? But it seems like we have a power section, we have the various FPGA banks and some sort of externals page. Let's go to the power section and then zoom in. I don't have Andre's libraries, or at least I didn't download them in, or install them, so, so keep in mind that this is not how it's supposed to be. So the power, we have some sort of regulator here, and bear in mind again the symbol is not shown. We have the various power pins from the Silinx Spartan S50 hooked up like so. And you can see quite nicely Andre has included that for this package, which is a 196 ball of BGA, we need these certain decoupling capacitors per bank for the internal voltages and so on. So I assume this is all right and he's done all that. What I don't like is that I have to turn my head to read this. Give you, you have enough space on the schematic page to make sure all of these, all of this text is horizontal. So I'd, I would also like to see that. Also things like grounds not pointing down, uh, I don't think is a good idea. You usually want positive power pointing up, ground pointing down, and you know negative voltages with respect to ground pointing down as well. Also the sectioning I don't think is too great. Yes, we have all of the regulated stuff over here, but then there's this floating ferrite bead and pie filter over here, floating vets down here. Also this floating reference over here, so sectioning could be done a lot better. Also this reference probably needs some extra decoupling as well, which seems to be missing. So I'd place at least 100 nanofarad capacitor over here. With my schematics, with my labeling, I don't like placing dots. So instead of writing 2.2 .2 microhenry, I'm gonna write 2 micro 2 henry. 
this dot will easily be mistaken for you know for example for just a grid setting for for the grid behind for example so 2u2 is usually how i would write it or ou1 for example for this 100 nanofarad cap capacitor here same with the resistors there's no reason why this transistor over here with a power good signal can't be hooked up straight to the left side of the, of the power good pin of this converter you have floating pins, it's good in KiCad to use on any ECAD program to place the no connection flag, for example, and that's just to make the schematic neater. Also, when it comes to multiple schematic pages, you want to, or I think it's preferable, to then change the designators appropriately. So everything on page one would be starting from 100, so I would have, you know, J100 here. Uh, if this is the seventh capacitor page, that would be the 107 capacitor, this would be 108 capacitor, and so on. Just to make sure when I'm doing the PCB design, switching between schematic and PCB design, I can also say, okay, this is component R309, that must be on page three. Well, on that, that, that seems pretty all right. We also have the mounting holes on this page, even though this is the power page, so I'm not entirely sure why. Let's go through the other pages. And again, this will look pretty messy because I don't have the libraries installed, so that's, that's my fault, so apologies for that. Text, again, please make that horizontal. So we have a resistor pack here, resistor pack here, but we could have also just used a resistor pack here and not used the fourth resistor. So consistency might be nice. Also, we don't have all of the nets labeled. So for example, this net here or this net here, this net here. On the PCB editor, that'll show up as Q2B pin 3 or something or pad 3. So, you know, of course, functionality fine. It'll, it'll work and it does work, as Andrew said. But there is a thing about being neat and having it kind of production ready, right? Also with these flags on the right side, you can indicate essentially if it's input, output, bi-direction and so forth. I would probably go to the effort with a, with a more involved design to actually annotate that. Signings JTAG, I would probably add ESD protection to at least those pins because those pins are you are going to you know, interface with a lot. You might want some debouncing on the reset line. We also have an oscillator here for the, which provides the system clock. You might wanna be able to slow down the edge rate from the clock output that might have really fast edges which might not be necessary so i typically put a series resistor in place typically zero ohms and then i can change that later if i have for example emi problems or signal integrity problems as before i would like to see more grouping so that there's a bit more structure the schematic but other than that i think it's okay this third page which said bank 34 must be the ddr2 bank so there's just a single memory chip as well as this is the FPGA part, which contains, you know, the data address command and control signals hooked up to the DDR chip. And for a simple design like this, you don't really need, you know, external termination. We have a 100 ohm resist on the clock line. And remember for the data lines, there is on die termination. I recently made a video on schematic design tips and I would not recommend using these four bar nodes because it can be hard to see if all four of these wires coming into this node are actually connected. You know, this one of these nodes might be slightly shorter, but this would still show up as this junction. Then we have the final page. Again, I would like a bit more organization or grouping. And this is some sort of global converter, probably contains some sort of ESD projection, which is then probably for an HDMI output. So functionality-wise, I haven't checked everything. Of course, in this brief time, I haven't made sure, you know, the pinout is correct, that the DDR interface is okay, but I think Andre says in his mail, and also in the EVA forum, that he got pretty much everything working. So that was the schematic, just as a quick run-through. Let's open up the PCB design, and you can see this is a four-layer board, so with a front copper, with an inner copper layer, a second inner copper layer, and a bottom signal layer. So let me just check what nets these are. So the bottom copper layer is plus 3.3 volts. Then we have, you know, some of the core voltages, 1.8 volts and probably like 1.0 volts coming from the regulator. Copper layer, which is closed at the top, is a solid ground plane, which is good. Now, because Andre has rooted this in four layers, so probably, I mean, there's going to be no concern for EMI or EMC. This is purely a board for function. So I'm very certain this wasn't wouldn't pass any sort of EMI or EMC testing. But for the purpose of the board, this is this is great and it's very impressive that he has managed to root this out, including this DDR2 interface on just four layers. So that's why he had to make layer three, the second internal layer, you know, a power plane, and layer two ground plane. Normally I'd recommend for four layer boards ground and ground internally with stitching vias between them. So let's look at this buck converter first. I don't really like the layout of this. So this is a multi-buck converter. We're gonna have many magnetic elements and then bypass capacitors or filter capacitors that output typical buck converters. I have a video on my channel called Twitching Regulated Layout 
and that's how to properly, so to speak, lay out a switching regulator. What you want to do is keep overall loop areas and loops as small as possible, especially high frequency switching nodes. For example, the switch node over here, switch one, switch two, and switch three. Andre is using very thin traces. So what is this? Uh, 0.3 millimeters, very thin, but yet decides to use a polygon pour on this side. The switch node should be as close as possible to the IC, everything kept as close as possible to the IC, and of course make the switch node only as large as it needs to be. So don't make an arbitrary large copper island or copper pour for all of these switch nodes. So I definitely like to see the switch node traces be bigger. Also these capacitors, you can see the huge loop area from IC through to the switch node, through to the magnetic element, through to these capacitor capacitors, and then very thin small ground traces into a single ground via. I mean, just see how huge this ground return path is going to be, or this whole switching loop is going to be. A much tighter layout, let me just move this around very crudely, might be putting the magnetic element like this, and the capacitors like so, right? We've decreased our loop by a lot, and I do this for the other sides as well. Then the feedback nets, so we have this feedback divider with R5 and R2, is taken from 1.8 volts, divided down into this feedback node. What I would do, because you want to keep this feedback node as high impedance as short as possible, I'd move these capacitors in, oh, sorry, these resistors in, and keep this trace as short as possible. Then veer down to the other side, I would veer down to the other side, trace on the bottom layer, and take a veer up again, just next to the output capacitor, to connect the feedback node. You don't want that anywhere near the magnetic element or anywhere where this trace can be disturbed. And I'll do the same, you know, for the rest of the switching converter. So important is to keep loops small. Okay, so I, I won't go over the rest of the stuff just for the sake of time. I hope the impedance have been calculated. For the DDR parts, we want controlled impedance traces. For the HDMI parts, we want controlled impedance traces. So I hope that's all been calculated depending on the stack up as well. Next, let's look at the BGA breakout. So the first thing which I see is good that we have, you know, essentially four quadrants in an FPGA usually, and we want to fan out this top left section, top of the first quadrant in this direction, top right in the top right direction, and bottom right like so, bottom left like so. You get what I mean. So that already looks pretty nice. Uh, I don't know what spacing this BGA has. This is a one millimeter pitch spacing, so that is ample space. So it uses a 0.2 millimeter drill with a 0.45 millimeter diameter via, which gives us an annular ring of 0.125 millimeters. Now there is plenty of space to go with a larger via here. They're more manufacturable, it's easier to manufacture, you'll get a better yield. So we have space here, right? You can you can increase this via by, you know, to, to 0 0.5, 0 0.55 to increase the value of this annular ring. You could even increase the via size. There's no reason why you can't use these 0 0.25 millimeter vias. There's no reason why you can't use the same type of via, for example, this large via everywhere, not just for power pins. For power pins, I would definitely make these wider, pretty much as wide as the pad. There's no reason to keep them this fairly thin. In terms of decoupling, you can see the decoupling capacitor placement. The nice thing is we want the decoupling capacitors always between a power and a ground via. And this is nice and close on the bottom side of BGA as usual. From a first glance, this seems pretty decent. What I already see here is the spacing here can be definitely improved, right? I mean, this is a tiny gap. Let me just have a see what that is. I mean, that's 0.1 millimeter, which is based on the edge of manufacturability of GLC PCB. And there's no reason we can't move this trace up a bit, right? We can move it up a bit, perfectly fine, and we have clearance here, we have a better clearance there. So if you have the space, use it. Same thing here. As soon as you have space away from that via, why don't you break out and move your trace further away? It doesn't cost anything. Sorry that I'm jumping around with this design of you, but this is just, you know, the first things I kind of see, and this is the first time you look at this design. This header pinout, I know you want to maximize the number of pins or pinouts you can get on a connector. The way to properly pin out a connector is to have at least one ground pin adjacent to every single signal pin. So this is a typical, you know, Arduino-ish kind of, or RSU Pi header, right? We have just power and ground on one side, we have loads of signal pins and maybe power and ground on the other side. You want a ground pin adjacent to every signal pin. DDR layout looks pretty cool. I won't comment too much on that. Of course, on a four layer board, you're gonna have real real space issues. So it's, it's a pretty cool job that he's managed to lay it out like this. Of course, I'd like to see maybe greater spacing, especially between the serpentines. You know, you're going to get a lot of cross talk, also intra cross talk between the same lines. So, you know, for a four layer board, of course, it's a good job, but, you know, you want more spacing in general. 
There's also this tantalum capacitor floating around, C37. And I believe on the bottom side, you know, there's no reason why you can't move that in close to the package and move the traces out a bit more. Also, by power and ground, why don't you rotate that by 90 degrees so you have a capacitor like so next to it and you improve the inductance, improve the power delivery. Same thing goes for this capacitor for this crystal. Why don't you move the crystal closer in, the capacitor, the coupling capacitor close to the crystal itself, shorten these ground paths, ground connections, make them wider, and so on, right? I mean, the basic principles apply over and over and over again. And here is one of my favorite mistakes to catch. So normally an oscillator will have, you know, power and ground, it'll have an output as well as an output enable. So normally we tie the output enable, if it's, you know, standard logic, we'll tie that to power. Now we have two power pins, we have pin one, looks like it's a power pin, but also pin four looks like a power pin. Given the decoupling capacitor placement, you would assume that one and two are the power pins. Well, let's pull up the data sheet and we can see that pin four and pin two are the power pins. Pin one is the output enable pin. So actually he's attached the decoupling capacitor to an output enable pin and ground. The actual power is pin four. So this capacitor, is doing, you know, close to bugger all. It has to be here, with a ground connection, with a via over here, right? That's why you should use net ties in your schematics, you should use zero ohm resistors to give pin one of this crystal a different net name. On the topic of decoupling, we have U4 over here. You can also see some of the silk screen is going over holes, which isn't great. This is probably the QSPI memory chip, and we can see the decoupling capacitor has been placed in the bottom. So there's no reason why we can't place them right next to the power pins on the top. We have enough space. So, you know, consistency, and I guess just paying attention with even just the simplest of designs. This might be a much easier package to root out than this BGA or this whole DDR2 interface, but the basic principles still apply. Okay, but overall a very, very cool design. It's awesome that you got this done in four layers, and thanks for sending that in.